the 3D um, printed part that replaces the um, plastic kit part here and you can see it's a lot more refined but what what we do have in each one of these little furrows where um, the rods go there's a little connecting point and it's easier to clean those off before you remove them from their uh, their printing uh, block so if you just go along the top edge of the bracket top that separates them all from there and then you just go in um, with I mean I'm using my seam scraping tool but um, they just snap off so something like a pin or something like that would probably do it um, or a very small knife blade but be careful that you don't damage the part so that's them re removed um, we can do the same on the other side and then these can just be removed and glued on which actually is going to be my next job I want to get them on before I lose them damage them that sort of thing There we go, that's all cleaned up now. And then to remove them, I simply um, I'm going in with my sprue cutter. Cutting it flush so we've got very little in the way of clean up. Now on the ends they have two connection points, it's one all the way and then two on the end where the uh, butterfly uh, nut is. So just a quick check. Here I've still got a little bit. Okay. We're just going to go in and flatten the bottom very, very gently. Just got to remember we're not putting pipes in, so we want this closed up and empty. So if you snap the top off, you can glue it on once you put the pipes in, but you can't uh, can't do that if you're not putting the uh, pipes in. I'm sure that makes sense. Okay, you got the general idea. I'll uh, just finish cleaning that up. I'm doing it with a very, uh, this is a 600, 600 grit, because um, I don't want to put any stress on the part. 3D printed parts are very, very brittle. So we have our 3D uh, printed parts on and they look great now that they're on in place happy with those um, and we've done the same process with this um, cap here um, that we did here with the um, Mr. Surfacer um, just to make it look uh, textured on the sides as well we've built up these um, we're not going to glue them in place we'll paint them separately ultimately um, and I'm just cracking on with cleaning up these parts. So I'm going to leave the tools off, but there is things that we can install um, right now before we do any painting. So we've got the base for the aerial, which can go in now. That sits nicely. Um, and although we're not adding the lights, we can put the mountings on and we can run the um, electric cabling for them as well and what I'm finding is the holes that they've asked us to drill out are not quite big enough so I just need to ream them up a little bit
Then yeah, that's better. Okay, and then we've got these little clips, retaining clips that go in at the back here. Like so, so that we can then just spot of glue on those. We've got three of those to do. In the middle, don't get caught out by this, faces the opposite direction because the latch is for that that panel there, just hitch that forward a little bit, and that's better. And the last one goes there. Okay, and then we've got all these holes have little crosses in, not that one. We're going to put the snorkel in that one. So we just have to make sure that they're all orientated correctly. They're all facing the same direction as that first one that I'd already glued in. Again, the fit is a bit sloppy, so you have to centre it by eye. There we go. So I'll finish doing those. Um, and that is pretty much all that we can glue on for now. But then we've got some photo etch to do. Right, we have um, a little bit of etch to put on the top plate here. And then the kit provides us with um, some, I think this is lead wire because it's, very easy to bend, uh, which we'll use for the cable for the um, lamps, even though we're not having the, the lamps on. Um, so I'm not putting all of the photo etch on for the tools, but there are some that we can put on. Um, so the um, bolt cutters that go right at the front here um, has um, a little retaining clip at the back that the handle back of the handle goes in. Um, uh, and it just rests on top, so we can we can definitely put that one on. So that's uh, Y14, that's this one here. There we go, so that just needs a quick bend up and, uh, and we're away. Then we've got two tiny little retaining clips for the hatches. Um, and, and the, well, I say clips, but the more stops really. Tiny little things they are. And again, they need a, a slight bend, but should be easy enough to fit. So we'll use a little bit of medium CA. Um, I use Rocket Rapid, that's my preferred. Um, it's a good, it's a good strong glue. Um, five to ten seconds setting, which works well for me. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm happy with it. Okay, we've got a little bit of bending that we need to do with that first. So we should be all right with the uh, Tamiya bending pliers with this. Let me just make sure there's nothing to clean up. So as we look at that, um, the handles are flaring out, so that hole must be on the forward edge. Well, that looks right to the instructions. 
at a slight angle. Not sure that the tool's going to go in like that though. Let me just check that. Now I've decided my angle was a little bit too acute, so I'm having a second go. That's better. Okay, next we have these little retaining clips. Now there's three little um, bolt holes on the hull, um, which is where the hinge for the hatch is attached underneath. Um, and these glue just behind those, so easy to locate these. There we go, just directly behind that. Let's do the other one. Try not to drop it. Okay, that's our two little stops on. that job done. Now it doesn't tell you this in the instructions but um, I've just leafed through the instructions uh, and I've worked out that these two parts here, part 15, are connected with part 10. So you can see here um, we've got the um, clip um, folded up and then there's a little piece in the center and there is no reference to that they're giving you the number for the main clip but for nothing else so I think that little square piece is the piece that goes in the middle and separates the two cables as they pass uh, backwards and forwards through that bracket so um, yeah um, just not labeled up but I think that's part 10 and part 15 Bend that first one up. I think we're gonna glue that center bracket in before. Oh no, let's bend that one first. Otherwise, the uh, tool will get in the way of the glued on bracket. I think. Well, maybe it wouldn't have done. And then we'll bend in that all the way over so it's flat just makes it sit a bit proud of the tank, which is the idea. Just check that square. Okay. So I think we can glue that on and then glue the little centerpiece separately. So let's just check where that's going.
Right, there's a little location point for it. So just here, there's a little raised squared off C, um, and that should fit with your folded over bit of photo etch. So we know exactly where it's going, um, and that shouldn't be a problem at all. So we'll put a little tap of glue on there. We we'll let that dry. By the time we've done the other one, uh, we'll be ready to put the little centre piece in. So our black base is now dry. And you can see that it's uneven because we've done it on brush and that's deliberate. I want it to be uneven. Um, Colours on, on roads and uh, cobble roads are not even at all. Now, um, we've got basically um, four different types of stone going on here. We've got cobbled road, we've got a lining uh, cobble, got a curb, and then we've got a, a pavement or a sidewalk, depending on whereabouts in the world you come from. Um, and what I don't want to do is have the, all the uniform uh, same uh, grey. So I'm likely to do the curbstone in a slightly different colour or possibly do the curbstone and the pavement one colour and the road another. This fundamentally will probably be the same stone as that. Start by painting in the curbstone um, because it is the uh, basically the edge of the road. Um, and I'm going to do that in um, 71050 light grey. Um, and when I'm doing it, I'll make a decision as to whether I'm doing the pavement in that colour or not. So we're going to do a slightly different approach to the curbstones than we will for the rest of it. We're essentially going to dry brush uh, all of this. But the curbstones, because I need to paint the edges in, are going to have a more painted approach so basically I'm going to paint with more precision but what I'm not um, going to do is paint in between the stones if I get some in between it's not an issue because there will be a wash going in which will smarten everything up and uh, make the stones individual but painting the stones is a lot more time consuming than dry brushing as you'll see um, when we come to do the the road in a moment the other thing about painting is we'll probably end up doing two coats whereas with dry brushing we can build the layers of paint up as we go we'll have to see how we get on And the reason why I'm using an acrylic is the speed of the drying time for the curbstone here. Um, normally when I'm dry brushing I would use an enamel paint. It's not always possible though.
Okay, that's the first coat down on the curb stones. So what I want to do next is the road. Uh, and we're going to use different grey. Um, and we are going to try and dry brush this. Um, and we're going to use Humbrol 240. It's quite a, a dark um, sort of green grey type colour, as you can see. By dry brushing it, we can basically build up the level of colour and get it quite even. So I've not thinned the paint, which allows me to move it around um, and put it on quite thickly. So I'm going to get that done and then I'll come back to you. Okay, so we have given a second coat to the curb stones. Uh, and I've decided that I am going to do the pavement in the same colour. And we're going to apply the paint onto the pavement cobbles in the same way as we've done the street cobbles. I'm going to use a flat brush uh, and we're going to effectively um, dry brush it in the first instance. So we're going to try and do it with a little bit more precision because um, what I'm finding is there is a variation in the quality of the. Um, uh, uh, st uh, stone, the print of the stone. So in some places it's quite shallow, in other places it's quite deep. Now at this stage it doesn't really matter because we've got a fair bit more to do to get this stone to to look right. Um, but what we're basically doing is just adding base colour at the moment. And because we've done the uh, curb in the same colour I can go over the edge, which means I'm getting right up to the edge of the cobblestone there. Now, we're going to have to put a little bit of extra paint in where we had that join just to make sure it's hidden. Uh, and that's come up all right, actually. Now, what happens with this is every time we put a layer of paint on, we're adding a bit more precision to the process as well. But at the moment, we can slap this on. It might look a little bit un uneven at first, but when we put the second layer on, that will uh, improve immeasurably. And when you can see that it's starting to get a bit thin, just stop, load the brush up a little bit more. Right then. Everything has had um, its first coat, which basically was two coats, I suppose. Um, the reason we gave it two coats is to try and even out the saturation of colour. And what we're going to do now is we're going to add um, a, a little bit of variation to the stone colour. Uh, and in the first instance, we're going to do that with a, a small flat brush. This is a five millimetre. Um, uh, and that's going to allow us to do that at sort of... Um, an individual stone level if we wish or more likely we're going to do it in two or three stones and the idea is to just break this up a little bit before we start picking out individual stones so what I've done is I've added a little bit of sand to this um, green grey mix um, um, I think it's Humbrol 118 I've added to the original 240 um, and we'll pick out um, certain stones and just add a little bit of alteration to the overall look of it. So the idea here is to just pick out some stones at random and break up the look um, of, the, uh, of the stones. So they start looking a little bit individual. So uh, it can be quite difficult to be random, I'm going to be honest. 
Um, some of us have quite a methodical way of working, so being random can be uh, a little bit difficult. Because we've just added a little bit of sand to the colour, um, when this dries, it's going to be quite subtle actually, and that's what we're looking for uh, initially at least. Don't worry if you go over onto other stones because we're going to break it up anyway. And what we're trying to do here is show that there was commonly more than one shade of this stone. I mean, if you imagine it was quarried and, and what have you, you're going to have some, some variation and we want to just capture that. So what I tend to do is work on a little area and then go and work in a different area so that when they come together, they are quite random. So we'll start right at the top here next. Do a couple together. And another couple together. Um, cornerstone there. Sometimes leaving a big gap, sometimes leaving a small gap. Uh, like I say, try and be as random as you can. any stones that you thought you hadn't quite got properly covered here's an opportunity to get them covered and when we've done this we'll add a little bit of white and lighten it up and do the same process again so that we've got three colors of stone across it The important thing is that any changes you do to the colour have to be mixed into the original base colour to keep it keyed in. So even though you can fundamentally change the colour, you want that sort of hue in there so it doesn't look like a completely different stone from a different region. So that is our um, second colour finished on here. Now it doesn't need a second coat on any of these because we put it on quite thickly um, and then when we do washes it'll pick out the texture of the stone anyway. So that's given me the initial effect to want. So what I've done now is I've added a little bit of white, you can see just here. Um, we've got a, a paler colour and we're going to do exactly the same process again and try and work it in between the two colours of stone to give us a three sort of stone variation. So I think a good place to start is next to one of the second colours. You can see the difference there between them. It's a lot lighter. So you can see that it's quite a stark contrast this time, but it'll all get keyed in when we give it a wash. And that's sort of what we're looking for. So the idea is to try and keep it random. And weave it in and out of the two colours that we've already done. So 
So we're doing a combination of stones that are on their own and then stones that are together. Using slightly different patterns to try and make it look like the stones were just put in in any order as they uh, were pulled out of the pile and they were laying them is basically what I'm trying to achieve. And when we've finished, we want to roughly have a similar number of stones of each colour, roughly. It doesn't matter if we've got more than one rubber, certainly not going to count them. starting to look quite good and obviously um, it will fade a little bit as it dries so I'll carry on and show you what that looks like when it's done okay so that is my three colors on now I know it looks a little bit stark now and actually looks starker on camera than it does in reality um, but bear with me we are a long way from done with this but it's starting to look like an individual cobbled street which is what we're after with our road surface now dry, I'm going to give it a little bit of a wash. And we're using um, dark brown wash from Humbrol, which I've then further fitted down with Humbrol enamel thinners, because uh, we don't want to paint it. We just want to add a little bit of definition between the um, individual stones on the road. Um, so we'll do that, and then we'll give that a good overnight to dry before we do the next lot of weathering. wash just keys in the colour of all of those individually different coloured stones and brings it all together. wash we'll leave that to dry overnight um, and then we can do the next step
so you can see that we have now finished adding the uh, colours to this um, cobbled um, footpath. Um, what I done is I've done four colours. I usually stick with three, but occasionally on a cobbled street, um, I like to add um, some dark red ones. Now I don't know why that is, but often when you walk down a cobbled street, you'll just see these random reddy brown. Um, stones it's, it's strange but you do do see it so i don't do it all the time but i chose to this time and i used 71039 whole red um, for that um, you can also see that we've put um, a matte varnish down on the um, main road bit here uh, and i'm happy that we've got the the base of the road right now there's still more to do um, with that but we need to tie in the road and the pavement a little bit as we go forward so my next thing is to give this a wash this has had about six hours to dry since the last um, color went down which was this darker gray um, I used base gray 71097 um, for my darker gray um, and I, I'm happy that it looks random it is very difficult to paint random because uh, your eye automatically sort of makes you put a pattern in without you even realizing that's what you're doing and and I can see a little bit of a pattern in places even though I've tried not to but anyway um, what I'm going to do is we're going to give it um, a, a bit of a wash now um, so we're going to make up um, a, a wash um, and uh, do that so rather than using the um, dark brown uh, wash that we use straight out of the bottle we're going to make our own wash for that so to make our wash I'm going to mix two um, acrylic tube paints together uh, burnt umber and black uh, you shouldn't ever really use black um, as a wash on its own because in reality dirt is never really black um, so um, burnt umber is a nice mucky brown color um, and I just want it a bit darker than this so we're going to add a touch of black. So um, a, a good way of doing tube paints is to use um, a, a blister pack from um, tablets for uh, a palette. It means you can mix and, and shade the colors um, quite easily and because these particular ones are acrylics rather than uh, I'm not using my oil paints because I'm putting acrylic on acrylic right now um, I, I can I can do a wash uh, with these quite easily just um, using a little bit of water so we're going to make a light wash give it a covering let that dry off and then we'll seal it all with um, a, a matte varnish so we'll start with a little bit of the burnt umber. And then we'll put a little bit of black in. And I'm just using tap water for uh, mixing these together. So we'll put our brown in first and then we'll put just a tiny, tiny amount of black in. We can always add a touch of yellow ochre or something like that if we want to just change the shade a little bit. There you go, that looks fairly thin. So we'll give it a go with this uh, back bit of path and see what we think.
So the key thing is we want it to really settle between the uh, stones so that we can see the definition of the uh, hay ring. And we can always block the tops a little bit. There we go. Yeah, I think that looks all right. So um, uh, the, the the wash will do two things. It will add the definition that we've just said, and it'll also just key everything together um, for this um, sort of shade. Uh, as we darken it, this brown shade will just key all the stones together a little bit, and it'll lessen the effect of the fact that we have different colours that you can see see there how stark that is compared to that so that's exactly what we're trying to achieve Okay, I think I am happy with that. So we will carry on with that and I'll come back to you when it's done. So after I've completed the wash on the pavement, which is now done, what I've done is I've added a little bit more black um, to the wash. Um, there was a lot less water in it by that time and just mixed up the sludgy stuff at the, at the bottom and gone along the curb edge just to darken that a little bit more. And then here there's a little bit of a dip. Um, it's ever so slight. So what I've done, um, as you can see, is I've then taken that dark um, wash and just brought it out a little bit to sort of show a witness as to where uh, a puddle possibly um, forms when, they, when it's been raining or something like that. Um, just to add a little bit of interest and variation to, to what's going on. I've also um, added uh, a second uh, amount of wash, even whilst this is still damp, uh, around these edges here, just to darken those a little bit, and in the corners around the edges of buildings and things, just to add some subtle darkness. So what you'll see is this path is slightly darker than the rest of it, and then there's some areas where you've got a little bit of darkness um, and just varying the modulation of the, uh, you know, of the filter of the colour really helps with the overall finished look. So I've just switched my overhead light off just to show you the difference. When I've got the, the light on, everything's a lot brighter. Um, and in real life, when this is on display, it'll look quite different to, to how you're seeing it. So just going to switch my light off and give you um, a view just using the natural light that's coming out through my side window from this direction. what you can see is it looks a lot more natural when you when you've got the natural light on it so if i bring this up a bit closer we've now even though we've got um a contrasting color on the road to the pavement we have keyed it in using um brown washes uh, we did a darker brown wash on here because this is a lighter colored uh, set of stones um, because these were darker colours, um, I, I was quite happy to use the um, Humbrol wash, but I just wanted to go a little bit darker for that, and, and you can see that that makes a difference. I, I also think this wash was that, that I made was thinner um, than this, but that's fine because we've got all sorts of uh, uh, dust and, and uh, other things to build up on this lot yet. Yeah. But I'm quite happy with that, how that looks. I think it looks quite natural, which is obviously what we're going for. Um, we do have um, snow and leaves to add as well as 
dust and, and other stuff. But the next stage will be to, once this is all dried off, will be to seal this with a matte varnish, uh, which we've already done here. And then um, we can have a look at what we want to do in terms of dust and muck on the road. And what I'd very much like to do is try and get a tram line so you can see that cars trundle along here. Um, so we need to think about uh, what we're going to do with that. But I think a paler dust colour might just help with that. Um, whether I'm going to spray that on or whether I'm going to brush it on, I don't know yet. I, lots of things to be decided. But you can see in the natural light there, that actually looks not bad at all, I don't think. I'm quite happy with that. Just clean up these resin parts. And it's just really taking off a little bit of flash from the bottom. And this tool is brilliant for that sort of stuff. Okay, I think that's that part cleaned up, so we can put that to one side. Let's have a look at that. Same, just a little bit of the casting flash along the bottom there. Right, let's build our crate next. same way up. Believe me, I have done it. Okay. Then we can just do the top. So when you look at these sides, you've got little fastener points on the top, and you've got a fastener side and a hinge side. So when you look at the top piece, you've got hinge so make sure you get them orientated correctly that's is what I'm saying OK, 
Okay, one wooden box. That all looks okay. So put that to one side to dry. Let's have a look at buckets next. So we've got one with a base and one without. So snip that one off. These appear to be slide molded, so they should be nice inside. Yeah, lovely and thin. Look at that. Assuming we've got a handle somewhere, but if not, we can make a handle. Let me double check I've not thrown the handle away. No, there's no handle on there. Okay, I'm just doing the bottom of this bucket. Interesting that one is two parts and one was molded as a single. I wonder if it's the shape of the bucket over the pail. Now right, let's see how that fits. Pops in quite nicely that. We'll glue it from the inside. There we go. Just make sure it's level. And we can uh, probably put a little bit of liquid in that. I'm going to leave a little bit of a, a rim because a bucket usually does have a rim. So I'm going to treat that as done. Put that to one side. We've got the pail here, just need to clean down the bottom. There you go, that'll do. Uh, we need to do the sides as well. But there's a seam there that's supposed to be there. It's like a little riveted seam on one side. And then there's a mold seam on the other side. So we just need to take the mold seam, which is the thinner of the two, if you're in doubt. That gets us where we want to be, I think. Nice flat bottom. Yeah, that looks all right. So that is also done and ready for the diorama. So put that to one side. That leaves us with the tools. So toolbox is next.